I'm Marta Vila. I'm going to present the Android settings, well, the Android web apps, but uh, here with me are Jose Garcia and Marcos from the Android team. And up there we have George. I'm going to be probably deferring questions to them at some point. So we are four people here. And this session is about introducing the three uh, Android web apps that kind of extend or support the configuration of the HIS2 or the implementations uh, through web applications. So it's for the admin normally. There are three Android. We only had Android settings for like three years. So now, and now we have three. So I keep saying Android settings web app, but no, it's the three of them. So we have the Android settings web app, which is the first one and the oldest one. And then we have two new APK distribution web app and use case configuration web app. I'm going to present the three of them. And I want to hear also, we want to hear also from you, how can they keep growing or which other ideas you think we could uh, take to this level of web configuration. So I'm going to start by the Android settings web app. Uh, for the three of them, I'm mainly going to review the menus and functionalities that they offer. So if you have been using any of those and have struggled or everything is unclear, please stop me right away. This is more like a let's explore the apps together. Because probably if you have a question, someone else is thinking about the same or I didn't explain it properly. So, so that's mainly what we are going to do. So the Android settings web app, the first one. Sorry, I'm seeing a bar here that you are not seeing, but I want to hide. Yes, OK. Uh, the Android settings web app is mainly meant to help you define the, the sync process, the data and metadata to control the, the, um, the number of TIs that you are. Mainly, we are worried about the, the amount of data that is downloaded. So for that, you can use the Android settings web app. It will also let you run tests per user. You can estimate how it's going to be the download process for a specific user. And it lets you also customize a little bit the appearance of the, of the Android in the phone, of the app in the phone. It's also the app that lets you configure the analytics that you can add offline in the, in the device. And it also, this save parameters in data store, this is that it has a new authority. No, This is what we mean with this. So until now, to use the Android settings web app, you need, the admin had to have the all permission. And we know that we don't want to give all to everyone. So now there is a specific authority for, for this app. You don't need to give the all permission to, to your admin anymore. So the first thing you find when you open the Android Settings web app, and let me show you where it is. Normally, you have to install it from the App Hub. So you go to App Management, App Hub, and you find it here. This one is, a, I have it installed, I think, yes. But yeah, normally you go there, you install it. It's not bundled by default when you install your DHS to, or when you run your DHS to server. Um, and this is what you see. So I'm going to go through this menu. We are going to start with general. So in general, what do you find? Analytics report, and I'm not going to go super in detail with everything, but I will share the documentation in the end and, and wait for your questions as well. But here is where you tell the server where to send uh, your analytics if you have a Matomo server and you want to see um, how your app is used, the, the volume of users. We are not tracking much of the user flow itself, but you can get some statistics from your uh, on implementation by adding here the URL. So you need to add the analytics reporting URL and the ID. The, the next two are for in case you are using SMS. So you're using the app for when there is no internet connection default to uh, sending the data through SMS. Here is where you add a few parameters about your gateway. And it's the, everything that you put here is centralized for the whole implementation. The next one is the reserved values. I don't know if you use that, but if you have pre-generated unique identifiers in DHIS2 and your users work offline, you can easily see how that is a problem. 
because the app can be generating IDs. In theory, if we don't take care of that, that can be duplicated. So what, they are, what, what we do is pre-generate a number of values and reserve them in the device. So the server is not using them and the app keeps on consuming. So this uh, functionality, when it reaches a 20%, so if, if you write here 100, when the app reaches a 20, we'll reserve 80 more if there is internet. So it keeps on reloading unless you are offline. If your user is offline for a very, very long time, we don't really have a solution. You might want to increase this number, but of course that can have downsides. Like if you have many users pre-reserving um, pre IDs, big numbers of IDs, and depending also on your pattern. So many things have to be kept in mind for, for using this, but this is the solution that we have for now. And here is where you configure how many values you wanna pre-reserve and download in your in your app to work offline. Then we have the encrypt device database. So you can encrypt the device, the database in the device, but you have it's not by default. You have to explicitly tell through this setting that you want the device to encrypt the database. And this has an impact on the performance, but of course increases security. So it's a decision to be made carefully, but definitely important. And the next one is, <coughs> sorry, a bit unknown, but very useful. You know that the app doesn't allow the users to take screenshots or share screen by default. But if you know that your implementation doesn't handle private information or personal identifiable information, you can um, disable that limitation by this tick on the, on the screen. So I don't know if any of this was new for you, but um, we, we, we think it's useful to, to present it because they, I, we don't think it's widely used, to be honest. And it, it gives a lot of flexibility for how you configure. So I'm gonna move now to the synchronization. What can we do to kind of shape our synchronization process? Oops, ah, yes. So <clears throat> there are two places where you can set the sync parameters. The user can decide how often the app um, is going to sync, etc., in the device in here. Unless you configure it on the central server. Once you decide on the central server that the devices need to send the data back every hour, every, not every hour, every day, every week, then the user cannot change that. The user can only manually trigger the sync if for any reason they want, but the, <clears throat> the scheduling will follow your configuration on the server. This is uh, it's important to know that from 2.8, the last version of the app, if the server that the, you are connecting is a for DHS to version 40, it's gonna use the new tracker importer by default. It wasn't like this at the beginning. At the beginning, you had to enable it. Or, or before this version, you had to enable it. I don't know why twice, <laughs> but, but you had to enable it. Now it's going to be by default from 240 and 28. It's not a big difference, but important to know when you report errors or anything. <clears throat> and then this is a new parameter. In 2.8, we support the file value type. But files can be very big. So we are controlling the download only. This is maybe something to be expanded. But the maximum size that you add here is gonna be limiting the download when the user syncs. If files are bigger than that size, the file will not be downloaded. So preventing from if you have, maybe you want to use, you have also web users that can upload things, then they will not be downloaded on, on the Android app. Then the settings for the sync process itself, they can be set at different levels. So we have been here in global. Now we are going to the settings here. So you can set um, everything that I said, the metadata sync and, and everything is for the whole app. But then if you specify different or, yeah, if you specify parameters for programs, you can do it for all your programs 
or for specific programs. And this apply everywhere in the app. You can do this, you can do things every, everywhere in the web app. You can do things for all your implementation or specific per program. In this case, you can define the maximum number of TIs you want to download in the first thing. You can set that. You can say based on what, right? Because if you say give me 50, yeah, but which are which are the first 50? I cannot edit. But here you can say based on what? Last update, I think, or enrollment date. You can also set a limit for the event downloads. And you can set also the you can set a, a date time for the events that you want to be prioritized. This is all about helping the server prioritize what do you want to download. And then you can add specific settings to your, I don't know why I don't have. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so TI, prioritize TIs that have been updated in this period or events that, that have the event date in this period. So this is quite, maybe it doesn't, it's not important for all implementations, but if you care about minimizing the download and, and to know what your users are gonna see, this gives a lot of granularity. And again, you can decide where to apply. Do you want 50 TEIs overall? Or I want 50 TEIs for each org unit? Or I want 50 TEIs per program or both? So you can, you can really, really tailor your configuration. And you can do it also per program. And the menu is exactly the same. But then you choose. Do this for the child program. I need less data for the child program. I need more data for the malaria program. So you can also do that. If you don't add anything, it will apply to all the whole app, the whole, app, the whole all the track, all the programs. If you set it here, I'm going to move quickly for the data sets. It's very similar, but it, what you, what it applies is for the <clears throat> number of data sets in the past that you want to download. If you want to store the data because it's useful for your user to have whatever has been reported this year, then you specify it here. If we don't say anything, Jose. It's going to download last 12 months. Yeah. And the same, you can set it for all the data sets in your app, or you can decide this data set I need to download more because it, the historical is used being offline, or for this one, I don't need it. Again, yes. <coughs> yeah, let me add one. So this one is monthly. So the fault is 11, okay. Let's see, I don't know if we have any that is different. Yeah, 12 weeks. No, is it the fault? Yeah. But again, you can change it to whatever you need. And the last thing that is interesting is the user sync test. So this is gonna help you, it's an estimation, but it's gonna try to help you understand the volume of the of the sync call, how big is going to be the download? What's gonna be the size of that process in terms of network? So you can add the name of the testing user that you have. This is gonna be based on your configuration, which metadata do I have access to and the, how much data am I downloading based on the parameters? And then you run the test. And maybe this is not the best user to run the test with. <clears throat> hmm? This user has a lot. Probably this is not a good idea. But I'm going to leave it running and come back later. So these are the settings. I already went through this. Yes, data sets and the user sync test. This is the result that you will see. And we are again applying recommendations, it might be different based on your configuration, but normally uh, we are <clears throat> recommending a maximum of programs to access or org units, etc. And we will tell you in red if this user is 
probably having a very heavy sync process, which maybe you maybe it doesn't matter because you know it's working over Wi-Fi and that's not a problem, but you can know. And then we move to the next section of the app, which is the appearance. So it's down here. Was that? Ah, here we are. Yeah, this was a big user. Maximum or units recommended 10. So I probably took an admin. So yeah, don't, don't, don't do this or change the user <clears throat> if you get these results. But again, it's only thinking of the sync process. It, it might be okay for you, depending on the setting. So appearance, again, it works or you can configure home screen, program screen or data set. But what can you configure? You can customize the filters. I don't think people is aware of this. The app has a lot of filters, depending on where you are. If you are in the home screen, you can filter by date, you can filter by org unit. If you are in a tracker program, which is the biggest one, you can filter by event date, by enrollment date, by org unit, by sync status, by, what is this? This is an attribute, <coughs> program attribute. Estado de la inscripción. I know by enrollment status is translated in Spanish. I'm not used to it. Enrollment status, event status, and if the if the TIs are marked to follow up. These are a lot of filters, and they might not make sense for all the users. Maybe in your in, in your implementation, you only train them to filter by follow up because that's what makes sense, or to filter by event date because that's what makes sense. The rest is noise. It's really not helping, but you can remove them here. You can decide which filters you want to see or not. So these are the filters for the home screen. In the programs, you can also decide which ones you want to display. And again, you can do it globally for all your programs, or you can say, okay, in this program, I'm using this filter. In this other program, it makes more sense to use this other filter. So you can add it here. And it's the same for the data sets. It can be global for all, or you can choose per data set. Sometimes you don't need all this granularity, but. So where is my, ah, this one. <clears throat> I imagine you have noticed that in the events, in the top right corner, there is a completion circle that we keep on uh, updating based on the data elements that have completed. So this, the user can know, am I 50% uh, done, 70, 80? This doesn't always make sense because maybe you configure a form that you know your users do not have to complete the 100%. You know, and that's not wrong. You are adding fields and some of them are not mandatory. Then showing that, it's not always good because they feel it's not complete. I, ha I have to reach 100%. By showing that, you are kind of telling this has to be 100%. So if it doesn't make sense on your implementation, you can actually by default is not shown. This message is confusing. I think by default is there and you can remove it. Like I don't want to see this spinner in this program. Then you do. We are going to have to check the documentation for this, but you can decide if you want it or not. I don't remember now what's the default option. So this is about appearance. And then analytics is also in this app. So you see, you have general for some server settings specific for Android. We have sync, appearance for filters, and the completion <clears throat> will. And then analytics. The offline analytics in the app are configured from here as well. And we talk about tracked entity instance analytics, and then home analytics, program analytics, data set analytics. You can put analytics everywhere or nowhere. By default, there are no analytics. You will not see any analytics, but you can add them. So the TEI analytics are a bit different. So I think we're gonna start by those. Oh, this is the spinner. I should use the slides. Uy, perdón. Sorry, I'm running out of battery. Thank you. 
she told me before starting, but I forgot. So this is a spinner we were, or the wheel we were talking about. <coughs> I don't know what's wrong with my throat. So analytics, what are offline analytics or local analytics or I don't know, Android analytics. These analytics are available, as I said, in any of the screens if you configure them to show up and they are calculated with the data available in your device. So this is important to understand because you can see different values in your phone and on your server because you can have more data here for, let's say, an org unit coming from other devices. But in, in your phone, you only have what you have entered or what you have downloaded. And they have to be configured using the settings web app. So the TI analytics are a bit different than the other analytics. The other analytics. These are the analytics that you find here. Inside the TEI dashboard. So they are here. Whatever you configure for your TI will be here. And they have a few conditions because it's normally the evolution of a value when we are looking at a person. So it needs to use a data element that belongs to a repeatable stage for it to display. So let's say you wanna track the weight evolution of a child, then the weight goes to the postnatal visit that is repeatable because the app is gonna be expecting more than one value unless you use a program indicator, a one value thing. But normally for charts, this is clearly not well prepared or well, it has no data, it only has one value. But if this data element was not in a repeatable stage, the, the analytic will not show. It has to be repeatable. Because what we are expecting is a trend to show you a, a, an evolution of any value. And the same for the program indicator. Yep, all right. Yeah, here we have one, the doses. Well, that indicator doesn't make sense, but. So I'm not gonna go through all of this. <clears throat> it is in the documentation, but these are the steps for configuring a TI analytics in the app. And the one that is more mm, required is the nutrition analysis that generates this chart. This one has a particular configuration that you have in the documentation and it's here in this slide as well if you wanna download it, but you need to have specific data elements created for this because these models, this is loading up a predefined model that requires two parameters. So, it, and it is a specific visualization type. You will choose WHO nutrition and then which type of visualization you want to see. And then here you will tell the data elements that are the source for generating that chart. So it takes a bit of configuration, but it's three steps, basically. So those are the TI analytics, and this is how they look. So you can have line charts or tables for the weight for age. <clears throat> but again, we are looking for a trend. So we need the data element to be in a repeatable stage. I'm saying it a lot because it, it, it causes trouble. It's, I don't see my analytics. Yes, it, it has to be in a repeatable stage. The rest of analytics are all <clears throat> different, but all, all follow the same logic. And they, you can apply them to a program or to a data set or in the home screen. So that is this part in here. We don't have any. So the way that works is that you tell the app that you want to add a visualization item in your analytics. And then it's gonna <clears throat> search from, yeah, it's preloading the last values, but it, this list here is the one that matters. This is coming from the visualizations in the server. You create your charts or your <clears throat> tables in the visualization app before and then you come here and say I want to see this in the app I want the users to see this in the app so it has to be created before and this part is sometimes a bit confusing because we cannot display everything for now we started with a selection of what we think is understandable in the phone 
and to see the adoption and, and if it's really used. So <clears throat> there are a number of limitations. So the visualization types that are supported are these ones, column, line, pie chart, pivot table, single value, and radar. The others will not be available in the list. They will be grayed out. It has to use relative periods. It has to use relative periods. So because it's gonna be consuming whatever is in your device. So the periods need to be relative. We have a maximum of two row and column dimensions for tables. If you put more, the web app will not offer you that setting, that, that visualization. And the organization units have to be also relative to the children. <clears throat> Sorry, to the user. Depend, you can use a user or unit, user child or unit, so, but it has to be relative. So if your chart or table that you have created in the visualizer is not available here, review all these parameters. Because most likely there is something that is not um, yeah, f following the, <clears throat> the limitations. It doesn't mean it's gonna be like this forever. We can increase the, the functionalities, but for now, this is what we added. So how to configure? <clears throat> That's what I was showing. So you choose one. You can override the title. If the object, I mean, the object will have a title, but you can choose another one because for whatever reason, your Android users need another title, you can change it. If you don't change it, it will pull the one from the object that you added when you saved in the visualizer. And you can use groups. So what are the groups? These are the groups. If you're gonna have many charts or tables and you wanna help the user organize them or you wanna organize them organize them for the user, you can create groups. So these are the, because let's say, I said you can have analytics everywhere. So if you put them in the home screen and you have analytics from different programs, you wanna help organizing them, no? Then you can create a group for the child program data, another one for the malaria, and there are no limitations, neither on the groups or on how many objects you add to each group. If you don't create groups, th this line will be empty and then they will be one after the other in a list. And the groups are here. You can say that you wanna use a group and create a group. <clears throat> and the last part, another thing that we have faced a lot, even ourselves preparing demos, is that maybe you can see a table or a chart, but the user that is going to download it doesn't have access to any part of it. So you can also check that. So you can say, this visualization that I have selected, is it gonna be displayed? So in this case, yes. Right, so you can, you can know because it happens, you configure everything looks perfect on your phone but then it's empty on the device. And sometimes it's a matter of access. Yeah, and then you save it. So the next time, I think you can choose by the group that you have already created, if you want to keep on adding. <laughs> so, I think this is all for analytics. And I'm repeating again the types because this is giving us a lot of problems. I mean, not problems, but to me is the most tricky part. Why is my table not showing in the list or the chart? And I have to go back and check all the configuration. So this is all about the Android settings app. <coughs> and before we go to the next app, I would like to hear a little bit from you. I, I realize this is the after lunch session. So I'm really sorry for, I, I cannot fall asleep here, but I would. But this guy with the picture was not helping either. He was, I was quite tense. So if we can wake up a little bit, if you can let us know, are you using this app? Or if you are not, any of, you, of what you saw seems interesting, or would you expand any of it? We really wanna know, because this app has been out for, what, three years? And we are running out of ideas. Mm -hmm. We have a hand here, Hanan. Oh, we need a we need we need a microphone. Jo Jose, can you help? Or Marcos? 
because I want to type, otherwise I will go. Hmm. I was dying, I don't know why. Uh, hi, Martha. Uh, I have a tricky question. Uh, mm. Sorry, tricky What situation. a surprise. <laughs> So the situation is uh, we are implementing uh, one urban health systems, whole country. And there is actually, uh, we have to use the Android app because of two situations. One is the, the satellite clinics, which actually going in some places where there's no internet. So the situation is there is fine. Uh, and the another place is the inside the clinic where there is internet. They are also 50% of the device at the Android. 50% as a laptop or desktop. Now the problem is the synchronization because one patient is moved to the service desk, which actually come from the reception. So he or she need to synchronize immediately. So yep. if we put the global synchronization frequency, that will not help. So how will be the best idea to solve this situation? So what we try to do, so locally we give the five minute synchronization for, <clears throat> for user group. If it's, but uh, there is no option for user group. No. So uh, there's a local setting by setting each of the tab differently will be very difficult for us. So is there any solution? Because uh, by this time, the patient moved from one desk to one desk, this might be five minutes. So we are assuming and we solve the problem this way. We solve the local synchronization five minutes and global is uh, said in a few hours. So when she come back, synchronize automatically. So what's your advice to solve this problem? The easy way. Right now, you have to <clears throat> solve it by training, adding the sync as the last action every time they change, which is not ideal, but it's what you could do. But ideally, this <clears throat> is familiar, Jose, with that. Uh, we got a request long ago, but it was very, we could not prioritize it on implementing the possibility to skip local. So you know you have internet, you are using Android for whatever reason, or you are in a Wi-Fi that is local, you don't have internet, but you know your Wi-Fi is there and your server is locally accessible. So we were requested to implement some high, some kind of, I don't know how we called it at that time, but it was like on the fly, you're using the app, but when, when you save, it's going to the server, it's not stored. So this would work for you if we, if we uh, did it right, Jose? And I think it's in the roadmap since 2016. <laughs> there is a Jiraisu, which is not solved yet. Not solved yet. No, it's, it's not the most common case. But would, would any of you benefit from something like this? One, two, three, four, five. I really like it. <laughs> no, no, it's, a, it's cool. It's cool. How do I call it? <clears throat> I don't know that now, but we can share with you later. No problem. How do I call this? Skip, skip local. Okay. With the aggregate, if we try online first and it fails, we say it's local. Why can't we do the same for yeah? Because the use case normally is the opposite. Uh, like we don't want to be hitting the server all the time. It's not only about the device. It's also about normally you don't want all your devices trying to save all the time on real life on real time. Normally, I would I would say. That server access problem. Sorry, because earlier we have a lot of uh, lot of threads in the server for the each synchronization. So. Now the newer version after 38 is a lot of less because we are monitoring yeah. the server as well. So after 38, this is significantly improved. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's not only yeah. because of performance. I mean, even if performance is perfect, the use case here is the opposite. You want to work locally. You do, you, we design everything local. Okay, is that, but and okay. because of delays, we are also trying to reduce the delays. Even if you have the best internet, local is always faster. Questions? Okay, are there questions in there? Please. 
just a quick one. Uh, we have been using this tracker application and uh, the areas where we are using it's in the northern areas, it's a mountain areas. So I will compliment the gentleman uh, point that uh, some sometimes, but most of the times I will say that we do not get to have the network coverage there. And uh, for this, we get to have a lot of uh, irregularities in the entries as well. So we get to have a different number in the app, different number in the tablet, and uh, they never get synchronized and they never get masked. So yes, challenges are definitely there. Yeah. So we are getting there. I mean, we are working hard for it. Yes. No, I totally agree. It's like we have not thought of a sort of mesh uh, setup in the for this app for now. Mesh network. <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was dying for a, somewhere. Do you have any other comments or ideas about this app? The yes. Android Settings web app. Ah, sorry, George. Sure. So I have an idea. It's also related to synchronization. And that is, uh, so for the stock management, it's not so much that we need it you know, constantly or every 30 minutes. The problem is more that if you have an unreliable network, that even if you set your synchronization frequency to once every hour, if there's no network at that time, I think there's no automatism to uh, synchronize it for the synchronization to make another effort than like every three minutes. So for example, it, we recommend that you synchronize once a day, it would be enough. And you set it to once a day, but if it doesn't synchronize in the night, then it's probably going to be another day. So is there a way to have it like um, like repeating the synchronization until it was until it succeeds and then just going to the next uh, you want to answer? period? Thank you. Uh, the, but it's icing on the cake, right? It's. Mm. I, I think if the sync fails, the app remembers. It doesn't try again, but it knows that it failed. And as soon as there is internet, it syncs. That's how it works today. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, <laughs> that's, that's yes. <clears throat> so if you have every 24 hours, the uh, the app will try to sync actually based on the time when you did set that 24 hours. If it fails, instead of keep trying, it knows that it failed. And then when it has internet, it syncs again. And then that's the last time it's going to consider for the next 24. Does it check whether there's internet every 10 minutes or? That I don't know. But it works because that that's what is done in Malakal in the hospitals. Sorry, I guess it's checking every every x. It doesn't. Re yeah. Okay. Yes. It's not the proper sync. It's more like a ping. But yes. Oh, but I checked. Okay. So we have a question in the chat and then we are going to move to the other apps if you don't have more questions. Have you been able to develop parameters for the choice of geographical map? This is a long overdue thing. So for now, the Android app uses always the, this question is about the, the background map, the, the, the layer that is used on the, on here. And, So on web, you have you can choose different uh, sources for this base map. In in Android, you cannot. So we have been asked uh, for for allowing <clears throat> to to choose the different base map on the server, like a configuration parameter that which base map you want your users to to use. The main reason is that in some regions in the world are disputed or unclear and different base maps show different limits, geographical landmarks and limits. And that can be really important depending on where is your implementation. So we we, we have not implemented this yet. This yet. Um, but, but it is on the roadmap, I, I cannot tell more. Oh, sorry, the question because I didn't tell. tweet the what you can do is like change the view of, to a satellite image as you, yeah. that you can but do, you but uh, not the border. Your, your, yeah. I mean, you have options, but the but the geographical 
Bartosz. Based on yeah. if there are no options. Which one you mean? This one? Yeah, no, the answer is not, not yet. Any, we move, we move on to the APK distribution app. Okay. <clears throat> the what? Okay, but we were talking about that since 2017. You found it? Can you share it with Hanan? <clears throat> so the next step is the APK distribution web app. The, the reason for developing this app is to help, to at least for now, to help having some control on the versions of the app that are used in the field. Because normally the most popular distribution channel is Google Play. And then when we upload a new version, your users, if they have, you can of course configure not to auto, but I mean, we know that sometimes they use their own device, sometimes not. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that easy. And then you can get <clears throat> unwanted updates that you have not tested or that have new functionalities that you have not trained your users to use, changes in the UI. I mean, there are many reasons for not wanting a new version just going without any control. And uh, this is normally something that you do with an MDM uh, system, but for so far, but also most of implementations don't have MDMs for the reasons we discussed in the other session. Um, Mainly they are expensive, they create big dependencies and there is no real good solution uh, open source. And, <clears throat> and normally when the budget expires or the project uh, finishes, the, those solutions die and it's not really sustainable. So for one part of the, of the functionalities that an MDM does, we can use this, which is the version control. So the APK distribution app, what it does is let you manage and control the version of the app that your users will do. So you get time to test before deciding that that's the, the version they are gonna use. So I think it, we better see it here. So again, this app is going to be in the app hub. So you go to app management and <clears throat> sorry, and then app hub. And it's this one, but we have it already. <clears throat> so we already have, normally you will not have here uh, anything. You will have to add a new version. And when you add a new version, it's going to ask you for the version number. If you have a specific minimum version of Android uh, <clears throat> to control to which devices is this applying or a recommended. And then the URL. So for now, <clears throat> what you have to put here is a URL to wherever you are storing your APK. You can also use our GitHub repository. The APKs are there if you are using the, the custom app. So you will come here. And then this is, what, this is the URL that you need. to put in here. Or if you are storing your APK because you have a custom app, you have to have it somewhere accessible. So how does that look in the device? <clears throat> the, um, the first time the users, <clears throat> is when the user logs in, right? When the user logs in, we are gonna check. Is, are you in the correct version? I did that before. That's why we are not seeing the, the message. But what will happen is something like this. The user can also check manually. So they will see this when they log in. Calling, do you want to update or you wanna do it later? If they say later, every day, it's gonna keep asking every day. 
we want to update, we want to update. So we will win at some point by insisting. And, and then <clears throat> I didn't test this with this version. Yeah, so they have to have a few extra steps than if they were using a Google Play, but it's not <clears throat> that much. So it downloads, this is the same, they have to say yes. Now my phone dies. No, let's give it time. But what, where is this coming from? Well, again, while it finishes from this one that was here. This is 2811. And now is installed. So this is a very simple functionality, but we hope it's uh, going to be useful and we want, we would like to hear, is it going to be useful for you? Do you plan on using it on your implementations? <clears throat> Talking to the audience now. Hello, audience. <laughs> Okay, so th this is what you, and you don't have to do anything on your, I mean, they have to have 2.8. Yeah, they have to have 2.8. But from there, I don't think this is implemented in 2.7. They will not know what's going on. <clears throat> so what else would you add here, if you could? In this, what's it? You have two. I just had. I just had a quick comment to the previous question, whether it's useful. I think it's extremely useful. I have worked in an implementation with uh, of uh, capture and rate, but actually we were sending around APK files. And for many users, it's easy to just tell them install an APK file. I have spent uh, on a Zoom call two hours with a healthcare facility to install an APK file, to download it, all of this. So I, I tested this, fantastic. It actually popped up on my mobile phone and can just download. And if you have a feature in an updated Capture Android version, and you have like a dozen or hundreds of clinics, you have to tell all of them just to communicate, much easier to do that. So it's it's a great addition, thank you. Thank you, George. George is one of our biggest fans. <clears throat> yeah, I, agree. I think it's very useful, um, but I'm also wondering if maybe it's possible that um, maybe we could allow the the versions that it allows maybe to be two or three. So let's say sometimes you have a diverse group of organizations which are still working within one system. So maybe one one team is um, looking to use a specific version, and then the other one is more than willing to move on to the to the earlier version or something like that, or they're not ready. Um. <laughs> Yeah, no, maybe just allowing both versions to be available to them would be good enough. Okay, user groups would be a very good way to block. Yeah. I was confident. Program, types of programs. Okay. I think yeah. this is the, the last comment. We need to cover the last uh, app, and we have seven yeah, minutes. So thank you. I think uh, it's a very good addition especially for us in Ghana, because we do a lot of Android uh, deployment. And the uh, last comment will really be important because that's what I wanted to raise. Okay. Uh, for our maternal and child health, currently we are doing a stepwise deployment. And so there are 
different versions that are available to specific users across the region. So it would be good to be able to control which region has which particular version up until when we are uh, able to do some refresher training to be able to move them onto the next okay, version. Okay, so you so, kind of want a phased, a phased um, yeah. deployment. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's a that's a very good idea. Okay. I think we're gonna move to the last tab because we need to finish uh, on time. <clears throat> yes. It's very related to the what we want to do with the web application rolled out to the different user groups that have been done. Very similar to what we want to do with web application deployment and being able to update applications and roll that out to certain users to test it and then roll it out to larger groups of users and, and be able to roll it back easily and those types of things. So very similar use case there. Okay. And we can work together on defining how to control that. Our last app, use case configuration. <clears throat> this is a very special app because this is an app to tell your phone that for a particular program, you need a different user flow, a different interface, a different user experience. So you have been hearing about LMIS uh, from the plenary session and then specific sessions. There is a module which has a specific app, but how do I use this? How, how can you switch it on on your, on your servers? You need a web app, the use case configuration web app which is gonna, you're gonna tell the phone that for this program, use this module, in the app is a module, use this user interface. So where is that? Again, you need to install like the other ones, but it's actually I wanna, I wanna go to this server. So you will come here, this will be empty as here, but this one is already configured. So you're gonna say, for now we have only, this module is hard code, it's, it's in the app. It has to be there when we compile it. So it's not dynamic for now. So we say, okay, we have different program types and one is logistics. For now we only have logistics. So we, you will have to say, I wanna use the logistics program and a description until now. <clears throat> This is not the HIS2 configuration, but then when you choose the program, it's going to give you a list of all the programs that you have on your server, all your tracker programs. And you have to choose the one that you have configured for logistics. In this case, it's called real stock management. So if I go to the app, I'm going to change the user now. And go to the LMIS user. while it loads. So here we are saying, for this particular tracker program, open, trigger this UI, this module. And it needs some parameters because the, the, the program has a specific configuration. You have to define certain attributes, you have to define certain data elements. And how do I know that? With the documentation. I'm gonna skip a few. There is a configuration guide that is going to tell you what do you need. You need three data elements to store your stock. You need a program rule to calculate what happens after every every time you, you distribute uh, or correct. Or <clears throat> So you need to have certain configuration that you can find here. And then you go to the server and tell the server. These, for example, are tracked entity instance attributes. Because what you are tracking are object, are, is stock certain stock. So you say the item code is, in this case it's called item code, but you could have another name, code only, for example. So these are your TI attributes that you need to have to use your program. In the next step, you will, these are, if I'm not mistaken, George, data elements, or this is a, yeah, this is a data element, for example, that will have an option set with where can this be distributed? That's based on your configuration. So you're gonna tell the app where to put things. So if you see all these labels, this is already on. So this is a, oh, well, 
this is a normal user that is accessing a number of programs, but one of them has a different user experience. So if I open, for example, the call chain, and I finish with this, this is the normal UI that you all know from the Android settings, from the Android app. But if you choose the real-time stock management program, which is the one that we have set here, real-time stock management, the app is opening a completely different UI, which is made specifically for this use case. It's a different user flow. And here, these are the actions that you are configuring, but the app needs to know <clears throat> where are my data elements, which data elements am I storing the information in? What are the attributes? So that's what we are saying with the configuration. We have to map our own configuration with the, with the fields that the app needs to run this UI. And that's all documented. It sounds a bit weird now. So, for example, in this case, for the LMIS project, it was really important that the first action is to scan the product. Then you have this here. And the app knows already which data element is going to be, which attribute is going to be scanned, because you told that in your configuration. So if you need to use the LMIS module, please come to these slides and download all the configuration. You just need to add a few configurations. You need to make sure you have the required attributes, required data elements, required program rules, and then map them. And then your app will consume that UI. I'm going to leave it here because you probably want to attend another session at two. So thank you very much. We don't have time for questions for this last uh, app, but George is always available. We are available. And we are in the platform and in the community. I'm yeah, going to be at 5 p.m. in the uh, expert lunch. What? 5 p.m. expert lunch. Is that? Yeah, we are in. Am I muted all this time? No, 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 you're fine. We are in the expert lunch from 5.